Okay, hello everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from in the world today to our webinar, Decolonizing Consultancy. And in the spirit of decolonizing language, I will greet you in my own. Assalamu alaikum and a marhaba from me. So a quick heads up, if you could all uh, mute uh, your microphones and videos until we're in our breakout rooms, but you're free to chat, use the chat function to jot your thoughts, your questions and comments throughout uh, this event. And we will be recording just for your information. So my name is Suzanne Hamad, and I am with you today as member of Intrac's Board of Trustees on behalf of the leadership of Intrac and as a sociologist and academic and consultant myself, who's very passionate about decolonizing discourses in my own practice and my research and writing and teaching. I take this opportunity to welcome you all and thank you for your interest in this webinar. We're really delighted to see how many um, uh, registrations there have been. We've had over 400 attendees registered. Yeah, it's an important conversation that really needs to be had. Yeah. And uh, I should, could you please uh, switch off your mics? Thank you. Uh, so this webinar is, uh, I should mention, it's the third of a series that Intrac has been running, and they're situated within the Shift the Power movement and with a view to its implications for civil society organizations, local communities, and donor and INGOs in the sector. And we do hope that today's conversation will create a space that stimulates exchange, reflection on what decolonizing consultancy means in practice, um, as well as across different regions, different organizations and positionalities. I say positionalities to encourage us to think not only as organizations, consultants and practitioners are labels, right? But also to dig into our own assumptions and previous ways of work that we are trying to challenge, which is not an easy feat sometimes. And we do hope that by the end of this discussion, we'll have been able to demystify what decolonizing consultancy actually means, what needs to change and how that can happen, and what different actors need to play to enable this shift. Today, we're grateful to have with us five excellent panelists who are gonna kick off this conversation, bringing insights from international and locally embedded consultancies, donors and practitioners. This will be followed by an opportunity for you all uh, to, to share your Q&A and then breakout sessions so that everybody has a space to input into this, into a collective think piece. So the discussions will be posted on a retro board and then recapped at the end where we will pull all the threads together, inshallah, uh, at the end of this event. We really look forward to your active engagement today on this clearly relevant topic to the whole sector. We hope it stimulates ideas for you to take back to your organizations and your regions. For us at Intrac, yeah. I should wow. mention that this is an issue that we are taking very seriously as we finalize our strategy. Uh, as we think about our role and contribution in the sector and work towards transforming how we do consultancy moving forward. Uh, before uh, introducing our uh, panel, I'd like to just flag a few reflections, which I expect we will be touching upon over the next half, one and a half hours of this webinar. So just uh, briefly to, to get us all on the same page and uh, a little excited. It's no secret that colonial legacies still have an impact on development cooperation today. And the reality is that programs are funded in the North, engineered and designed in government institutions or affiliated institutions. So the power imbalance is embedded in this reliance on resources and external agendas. Though we all know it, how effective have we been in finding a way around it? Or must we play the game and maneuver change within the scope? So just put, putting out some questions. Secondly, when we talk about shifting the power and funding partnerships, monitoring and evaluation and whatnot, we, we can't do that in isolation of a discussion about that inherent power imbalance that's embedded within the consultancy. So from a donor perspective, decolonizing development cooperation, and from a grounded perspective, we hey. words we use are localization, community empowerment, Doing that is not only about respecting local knowledge and existing local capacities, it's about intention. So it's about the intentional employment 
of these capacities and engaging them and allowing them to shape and reshape development agendas of which consultancy is a critical part. So is this really shifting or is it lip service? So as part of that, there's a decolonizing of knowledge production. Who's drafting the TORs? Who determines the methodologies? Who vetoes them? To what extent do consultants in the South have a real say in each step along the way? And can that change? Who's doing the hiring? So again, we link to the resourcing, which takes us back to the power diet. How, do, how deep do we need to go to reconfigure this power imbalance, which has repercussions down the line? Then there's the perception of the consultant as the all-knowing expert versus the facilitator who elicits indigenous knowledge that is relevant and meaningful. Some institutions in the South themselves are still trapped in this mindset of we need someone objective from outside or that expertise is, is better from, you know, from the North. This is slowly changing and I've seen it with some of the donor communities in Jordan and Palestine in, in the MENA region. But how, where are we now? Like, to what extent is that actually shifting or is it still a fixed mindset? And I have mentioned decolonizing methodologies, but I must emphasize that it, it, we should go beyond participation to engaging and in placing methodologies uh, within the consulting that we do. Uh, I will close with a quote from, from the blog that uh, frames this discussion that was published yesterday, and I hope you all had a chance to read it. Um, consultancy presents a space and an opportunity to do development differently. This can mean centering local knowledges and expertise, bringing these ideas to global actors who may not otherwise hear them, or breaking down unequal power structures and reimagining relationships. And on that note, uh, I, I'll be introducing our panel who will bring with them, uh, share with us insights from practice from their regions. Uh, and we have with us today, uh, Nancy Kankankusi from WAXI, which stands for West Africa Civil Society Institute. She will be speaking about the decolonizing advisory platform as a means to promote decolonizing consultancies. Nancy is a development pra practitioner and social science researcher with experience in international development, development research, and knowledge management. She is a trained urban and regional planner and a certified trainer on local fundraising and mobilizing support under the Change the Game Academy. What a great name. Nancy is the program officer for knowledge management at WAXI. At WAXI, she's leading in curating, documenting, packaging, and sharing learnings and knowledge on civil society to facilitate growth in the civil society ecosystem. Nancy also leads a diverse team of civil society actors to initiate and implement international development programs that promote community philanthropy, shifting the power and resources to the grassroots, localizing and decolonizing development initiatives in the global south. She is the project lead for the Ringo project and an idea career for decolonizing advisory community. And uh, for those not familiar with Ringo, that stands for reimagining the role of, re of INGOs. Um, maybe wave hello so people can recognize you, Nancy. Yeah. All right. We also have with us Rob Lloyd, uh, who will be speaking about, uh, who will be reflecting on what decolonization means for an international consulting company. Rob is managing partner of ITAD, a global consulting company supporting clients in international development to use evidence to make better decisions and strengthen their impact. He has worked in consulting for over 15 years and has supported a wide range of governments, foundations, and not-for-profits to engage with and use evidence in their decision-making. So Rob, uh, uh, maybe show yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ellen Gillis. Uh, works with ADISO, that stands for African Development Solutions, correct, Elena? Yeah. So um, Elena will be sharing with us today ADISO's experiences in building a consulting company with dedication to contribute to decolonization. Fascinating. Elena has worked in international aid and development for 10 years with a global community of people dedicated to addressing power inequality and promoting social justice. Elena now works with the organization ADISO, known for its global advocacy on and alternative solutions to decolonize aid. 
She manages one of Adiso's social enterprises focusing on consulting and training for Global North INGOs, donors, and individuals in practical ways to decolonize their organizational culture, their programs, decision-making, and resourcing. It's happening, isn't it? So Elena, maybe a wave so people see you. Thank you. Uh, we have with us uh, Ala Shaheen, uh, who is country director and found, founder of Beit Al Karma Consulting from the MENA region. He will offer a perspective from the MENA region. Uh, Ala has supported consulting firms, NGOs, and public agencies to achieve disciplined business development, proposal development, monitoring, evaluation, and learning processes had training over 5,000 professional service providers and development practitioners on how to win proposals, how to build trusted partnerships, develop robust MEL plans, communicate and report with evidence. Um, Beit Al Karma is one of many regionally based consultancy firms in the MENA region, which have been receiving funded development projects from major northern, northern based donors and multilaterals such as USAID, the EU, West Bank, um, sorry, World Bank, uh, Echo, GIZ, among many others. Ala, thank you for being with us today, a big wave. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have finally uh, uh, Sam Barley uh, from Comic Relief. Uh, she will share with us today Comic Relief's approach to decolonization as one powerful player. As one player, albeit holding much power, we are making small changes within the existing system and recognize that paradigm shift is a much bigger collective effort. So Sam uh, has worked across the international aid sector, humanitarian building and development for the past seven years in both MEL and fundraising capacities. And they recently joined a monitoring evaluation uh, and learning within the system change and perspective. Part of this role includes commissioning consultants, mostly for our collective learning work, but also program evaluations. In both these areas and many more, Comic Relief is trying to improve our commissioning and consulting, to be more power aware and scrutinize our systems and processes to contribute to tra transforming and advocating for change in the system toward a decolonized sector. So a beautiful, uh, maybe a hello, Sam. If so people recognize you, thank you. Uh, what a wonderful panel. We are really thrilled to have you and appreciate your time. So without further ado, it's over to you, uh, kicking off with Nancy for some insight on two key questions we'd like you each to tackle in this webinar. How can we work together to decolonize consultancy? What are the most practical steps NGOs and those supporting civil society can take to make this happen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and hello, everyone. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity to be here to be talking about decolonizing and also talking about the whole concept of decolonizing consulting. So um, I'll speak from the perspective of what we are doing at the West Africa Civil Society Institute, WACC, um, um, and also the work from the Ringo Project. And um, for what see, and also largely the, the conversation that we have at the Ringo Project, for us, when we talk about decolonizing consulting um, at, um, at a, as a bigger concept, what we are actually looking at and the conversation that we are speaking to is how do we dismantle where knowledge um, and capacity building and resources sit in the development space. So um, there is the colonial and historical narrative that knowledge largely sits in the north, capacity building are mostly driven by the north, and um, the north is often seen as like experts largely in impacting knowledge largely to global south actors. So this is the conversation, this is the narrative that um, when we are looking at decolonizing consulting, we are looking at creating the spaces and opportunity to disrupt this narrative. Um, and, and that is what we want and we expect from all global partners to join in, in that manner. So practically what we are doing is we've created the, the space and opportunity to change this by creating the decolonizing advisory community, which is an online space where we are seeking to bring together um, advisors, consultants, um, experts, and all um, individual civil society and, um, um, and um, um, actors who are in the global south, largely 
with knowledge, capacity, and um, some resources on how to decolonize on and all related issues with regards to decolonization and development change to come together for us to facilitate knowledge sharing, capacity building, and also dismantle the narrative that capacity building only lies in the north. So the platform um, is a place or is a community where we are having advisors or global south experts engage and facilitate knowledge sharing. And um, it's an online space, which we are currently building it as, as, as of now. And once it's ready, there's a space for all advisors to join and, and engage with that. And what we are doing, what we'll be offering is that this is the space that you'll be able to meet Global South experts, Global South consultants, Global South advisors, who are also committed to dismantle the knowledge um, um, or the, the conversation of where power sits or where um, knowledge sits. And they also are experienced, they have the capacity, they have the local context, they have the, um, um, the knowledge and the portfolio to also support Global North organization, institutional funders and INGOs who are genuinely interested in decolonizing their practices, their policies and ways of working, and who are also genuinely interested in getting knowledge not only based in the North, but also knowledge coming from the South. So that's the community that we are creating, and it's not only going to be a space to facilitate capacity building and knowledge sharing, um, um, support to Global North organization and INGOs, but it will also be a core space or community for the Global South advisors to share learnings, to build themselves, to connect, to collaborate, and also to engage as a community. So that is a space that we are creating to dismantle and also to promote decolonizing consulting, um, consultancy from um, the South. And um, we will we actually open it up for all advisors, for, for everyone to join the community from the South, if you're also an INGO, an institutional funder from the North, and you are genuinely interested um, in decolonizing your policies, your practices with advice and experts from Southern um, um, consultants, this is also a space that you can also join and join the community to go through this journey with us. So um, that's what I will talk about for now. Um, Susan, I will hand it over to you. And I think um, when we get to the question and answers, there'll be more space for me to expand better. Right. Wonderful, thank you very much, Nancy. You've uh, wet our appetite with uh, a tangible platform that's happening to dismantle and disrupt the narrative of power knowledge. So thank you very much for sharing that. And uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat uh, for later. Uh, Rob, can we move on to your uh, perspective? Happy to, Suzanne. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Nancy, for that. That was great. And also for Interact for, for organizing, organizing this event on such an important issue. Um, as, as we said in the introduction, um, ITAD's a global consult consulting company. Uh, we support clients to use evidence to make better decisions and strengthen their impact. And really, at the core of what we do uh, is monitoring and evaluation and learning. Now, as an international consulting company, when we work with clients, we, we're often delivering quite large multi-country MEL assignments where we're gathering evidence. We're using this to support learning and informing decision making at lots of different levels. It could be country level, regional level, global level. And in doing this, we, we build consortia and we build teams from across the globe with consultants and partners, both from the global north and from the global south. I, I, I give you this background because it, it's very much the lens through which I'm going to engage with and try and answer some of the questions that the panel, uh, the panel were given. Now, as an organisation working in development, like so, so many of us, um, we've been reflecting a lot on what the decolonisation agenda means for us and how we work. Uh, based on lots of internal discussions and planning, we've now got some very clear commitments as a company around you know, what we want to do differently moving forward. And some of the things I'll, I'll touch on in a moment, but it's really just to stress like we don't pretend to have the answers on this one. Uh, we're still very much on our own learning journey uh, on how best to engage with the decolonization agenda in the most meaningful way. Um, so what, what do I think 
decolonizing consultancy means in practice? Well, I think at its heart, it's about redistributing power. It's about those with power and privilege letting go and allowing others to step into the spaces that they've previously claimed. Um, and it's also about ensuring marginalized voices are heard much more loudly in uh, consultancy assignments. Now, these are big shifts and they're going to have to manifest themselves in lots of different ways uh, in international development consultancy. But the thing that I'd like to focus on today is, is what it means for who delivers what in consulting assignments. So for me, the key shift that decolonizing consultancy requires is that the design and the delivery of consulting assignments is done in a way that prioritizes much more the knowledge, the experience and the skills of consultants embedded in a particular context. So in the part of the consultancy world that, that I know best, which is the monitoring, evaluation and learning sector, it means moving away from this tired fly in, fly out model of delivery where Western experts drop in to collect data do the analysis elsewhere and then support the clients at all levels to engage and learn from that evidence. And I think it means much more moving towards a model where those from a region or a country lead the work. Uh, and this means country and regional teams owning the approach and the methodology being applied in their context, owning the analysis and then supporting the clients they are closest to to engage with and then use that evidence. And I think at the end of the day, this way of working delivers better consultancy. Um, it will mean methodologies are more appropriate to the context. It means insights are more nuanced, they're more contextually grounded, and the communication of the recommendations are done in a more culturally appropriate way. So in terms of what, you know, what does this mean for an organization like ITAD, an international uh, consultancy organization? Well, I, I think it's there's three, there's three things, there's three changes, shifts that need to be made. One is working equitably. The other one is learning to play a different role. And the third is really feeling more comfortable about feeling uncomfortable. In terms of working equitably, two things. I think it's about building diverse consultancy teams that have a much stronger Southern leadership and ensuring country and regional work is led by those uh, from the context. And then it's about establishing partnerships with organizations in the global South that are much more equitable and mutually beneficial. And this, this means more kind of co-leadership of consulting assignments between Southern and Northern organizations and building much more uh, off each other's relative strengths. In terms of learning to play a different role, you know, the, the types of shifts that I'm describing here means changes to who does what in consulting assignments. And in the context of MEL work, it means more work sitting at country and regional levels and being led by teams and organisations in those contexts. And this requires international consultancies to, to play a different role. It means focusing on things where they have particular strengths. It could be securing resources, building and managing global consortiums, leading comparative analysis, um, international learning and exchange, managing relationships with donors and funders uh, in the global north. And then this last point of getting comfortable, uh, feeling uncomfortable, there's no question about it. This, this is quite tricky stuff and it requires um, international consultancies really to take a kind of a hard, deep look at themselves and how they work and reflecting on, on their values. And this can be uncomfortable, but I think it's important that we embrace that uh, and we lead in to the lean in to the discomfort uh, because I think a big part of moving this agenda forward is, is feeling OK with not having all of the answers at this point. Sharing and shifting power is difficult. It's messy. It takes time uh, and it very much requires you to, to, to feel your way forward. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Rob. That was inspiring and, and very brutally honest because it is a learning journey. It is uncomfortable for a while and it is messy. But with the intention, it, everything is possible. So thank you so much for sharing that. Just a quick comment on uh, a chat I've seen uh, about the language and terminology we're using, Global South and capacity building. Uh, definitely, uh, it's an issue that needs to be considered within this discussion. So absolutely agree. Uh, move to what, shift to what is another uh, a topic for another conversation. But please bring it up in the, in the chat rooms. Um, so can I invite uh, Elena Gillis uh, to please take the panel, uh, present her, please. 
Sure, thanks, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Gillis. Um, I am representing the organization ADESO. ADESO is an African organization with its roots in Somalia, um, founded by Fatima Jibrel and now run by her daughter, Degan Ali. And ADESO, if you know it, um, great. If you don't, um, it's an organization that has pioneered a lot of solutions um, to drive power and resources to communities um, in which aid is taking place. Um, so for instance, ADESO led the localization movement and grand bargain targets um, in 2016, and it has really become a voice of change within uh, rethinking aid and decolonization. Um, and our consulting work got started about a year ago. Uh, and when we got started, one of our first conversations um, was with a peer and a friend of Degan's, Musimbi Kanyoro. And she asked us in that conversation, how will you do consulting differently? Right. Um, and we've been grappling with that. We've been thinking about it ever since. And at this point, our answer is three ways. <laughs> Firstly, our consulting generates income for ADESO as a social enterprise to contribute to a future of independence from grant funding as an organization. Um, so trying to decolonize itself, right? The second is that we work with institutions implementing or funding um, programs in communities to guide them in decolonizing their organizations. And then third, we center our services and how we operate in values of decolonization. And we've identified four that we find most relevant. Um, and they are respect, mutuality, transparency, and dignity. I was asked uh, in preparation for this to give examples and practical examples of what this means and what this you know, sort of some of the decisions we've made over the last year. And so I've, I've made a list. Um, <laughs> the first is that we build consulting teams who are brave, honest, and committed to true social change, right? The elephant in the room uh, and in any meeting I go into is that I am a white American woman who lives in the United States and I am managing a decolonization consultancy um, that is done by an African organization, right? We are really focused on prioritizing, working with people who share our vision and share Adesso's vision for decolonized aid and who are open and honest and invite really difficult conversations. They're activists at heart. And we really try to build teams that are super diverse because diversity, you know, diversity of perspectives, experiences, skills makes a stronger team. But we're really focused on um, building the, the team that really complements one another and um, that will really, you know, stand up for what we believe in. Another way in which we have been decolonizing consultancy is that we do not pursue projects that are checkbox activities for DEI or decolonization. Um, and therefore we do not respond to RFPs. Um, any contract uh, or any project starts with a conversation with a client and we design scopes of work in partnership with clients that are intentional about you know, addressing root causes of inequality. And we also do our best to organize a team of consultants prior to the scope of work being defined so that scopes are built by their expertise and knowledge and they own the scope of work from the start rather than being told what they're doing on a project that's already been designed. We enable flexibility from the start in our contract because we know that decolonization is not a step-by-step -step process and it will consistently change as the client gets to know us and we get to know the client um, and every client has their own journey. So we consistently look back at the and revisit the scope of work. We invoice clients up front rather than based on deliverables. Um, 
principled reasons for it, right? Questioning the notion of trust, respect, and the power dynamics between consultants and clients that are typical. Um, and we need to pay our consultant team members monthly for the time that they've worked um, through respect and dignity. Um, and we also build projects and processes that actually teach um, the you know, ways of working that we want and practice of decolonization that we want clients to learn. So um, for instance, right now we're talking with a potential client about designing a theory of change for their organization. And we've suggested that it's the theory of change act is actually created by their local partner organizations and then presented to staff to actually build on, right? So that's an example of what we suggest. Um, I think I'm really close to time, but just uh, <laughs> I think, you know, the we've we've been having a lot of fun power um, challenging the power dynamics that and the traditional Western consulting model and approaches. Um, and we find that some are really excited about it and others are really struggling with it. And to me, it just shows who will move this effort and decolonization forward and those who will remain behind. Thank you very much, Elena. You definitely nailed it with uh, concrete examples. And it's great to hear what's working and, and wh where you're struggling. And we'd love to hear more about that later on. Thank you so much. And the values uh, driven combination with diverse teams, uh, kind of like uh, it aligns with Rob's piece, but like giving it a lot more of the, the values and how you do things is very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Let's move over to the Middle East, North Africa region, um, where a lot of funds have been invested in the past uh, decades. And hear from uh, Ala Shaheen. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Susan, for uh, this introduction. Thank you, Intrac, for inviting me to talk. And thank you, speakers, for what you have just mentioned. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, to add on Elena. It's great that you have been able to make courageous decisions to not to bid to RFPs. So this bid or no bid decision is a great uh, is a great aspect and courageous one. Not everyone has the luxury to, to, to do it in, in terms of civil society organizations in the region or in the global south. But it's a great one. And you have adopted or adopted a proactive approach to funding in which you cooperate and collaborate and co-design things with donors. And so you have reached this stage and I think uh, uh, it's a great stage, And uh, but it needs a lot of, uh, of foundations to, to have it successfully, including thought leadership and uh, capable staff to handle it, uh, which again, again, goes to the knowledge power and how much knowledge uh, you have in order to affect and uh, and equate yourself with donors. At, at the end of the day, they are the ones who have all the money. So decolonizing is so difficult sometimes because still there are people putting money in and we are the ones who receive, receive the money. So thank you that, for that. It's really interesting to hear that. Uh, and uh, my name is Ala Shaheen and I am uh, from the region, from the Middle East and North Africa and based in Egypt and Palestinian originally. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm heading a consulting firm called Betel Karma Consulting. We do the same as any consulting firm. We are, uh, some, sometimes they call us a payroll company, but, <laughs> but, uh, but we are consulting. We provide routing and evaluation learning services. We provide proposal writing for NGOs, for civil society companies, civil, civil society organizations. And we have trained a lot and uh, for a, Many people have attended our training courses and we have helped a lot in how they can be sustainable organizations, to be proactive, not reactive as Elena's organization, and to be resilient and be able to stand alone by themselves. But still, we uh, we need a, 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 a lot of help in terms of thought leadership and uh, solutions to implement. And this doesn't mean that we don't have to get experience from the West. Still, we need to get experience from the West, learn from the West, and adapt what we are learning from the West to our local situations in, in terms of our context, political context, cultural, and religious, where the West doesn't have it. So, so we, we can come up into a collaborative relationship. And this is what decolonizing, I think, is the way that it should be. So it's not uh, by 
dictating uh, uh, power from someone to another one or giving power to someone else, but it's it's a, it's a more of a collaboration and co-design and co co-owning. Uh, in terms, of, it's it's in the region. We are working in the region. It's it's not it's not it's not a secret to say that if someone telling us what is the effect of development aid, we come up to nothing somehow, little and little and little. So there's a lot of money invested with little sustainability, with little sustainability of impact and benefit and, and, and benefits to the people. People doesn't feel meaningful benefits of these money, although there's a lot of money has been sent. And at the same time, people and consultants and local NGOs are always stigmatized by being agents for foreign, inter for foreign organizations. This limit their work, at the same time, it would put them in risk. Decolonizing with, with, real, with real decolonizing, with real intention of building trusted relationship between donor agents who are still in the, in the, in the play because they have the money, and having this relationship with the local people and giving them the power and the voice to talk and to change and steer uh, projects objectives, steer different kind of project implementation methods and implementation mechanisms, uh, they can be able to stand and they can be able to, to do the work much better for the benefits of the locals and for, for the uh, for the uh, for the donors, and today I have read the article that Entrac has 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 written on decolonization, and the the article was questioning about the accountability. Whereas, where decolonization for consultants and for local NGOs as well, the accountability should not be only for the donors and for the ones that we receive the money from, but we are accountable to our own people. We are accountable to the people we serve. Uh, uh, and 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 this is more accountability, and uh, uh, we should have more stress on that more than we accountable to the who is paying. Uh, 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 I think uh, one of the for the for the consultancy decolonizing, and what I have seen in the in the in the in the region, on in Egypt and the North Africa and, and some countries that it's it's a, it's 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 a relationship, it's a trusted partnership, and I think. Uh, uh, donor agencies and international ones should have a build relationship that is equitable and trusted, and that it's helping local consultants uh, rather than uh, to do the work, rather than to punish them, rather than to aggressively use their contractual clauses to destroy local consultants. Sometimes it happens that so many organizations in the Middle East, like many OU and organizations and so on, they, they destroy uh, consulting firms. Uh, uh, because of uh, of being so aggressive sometimes, and it's not helping them to do the work. And this is important. I know that it's it's at the end of the day they are consultants, they are contractors. But it's to decolon decolonize. You need to help them to stretch their hands up and to to elevate their work and to support them and to help them even in giving them contracts and grants and not to leave them, build them, incubate them, and let them lead and let be in the forefront and put their voices and put their people's concerns and sometimes their national policies concerns. Uh, uh, so this, this kind of relationship is really, and so many consultants working in the, in the Middle East, they go with the clients and this relationship in three months, divorce. It goes into divorce and, uh, and, and struggle and, and, and fight and so on. And, and that's why in decolonizing, I believe in terms of consultancy, and the local part of Global South, from my point of view, donors, international organizations needs to work with local consultants as partners, supporting them, understand their weaknesses, understand their strength, support both, but not to go into uh, uh, a confrontation relationship. So let's be, I mean, as it's a trusted relationship much more. Uh, and that's at the same time helping local organizations and local consultants is building their thought leadership. Still, I think everyone, uh, the West learns from the, North, the, the South and the, still the South where it learns from the West. So we still need so these kind of uh, learning solutions and adopting them and applying them to our region. Uh, so I think the end of, the, of my presentation today is to to build an equitable, trusted relationship, supportive one uh, for local consultants and for local NGO civil society, helping them to lead uh, that change. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Ala. A lot of food for thought here. What strikes me from your uh, your talk is about the amount of money that has been channeled into the Middle East, but with little impact or sustainability, just reaffirms the importance that of this conversation that we're having. Something is not working and how to make it work. The downward accountability, so shifting not only the power, but shifting the perspective downward accountability to uh, look, which is localization agenda and the two-way learning or mentorship relationship that you would like to see more of between international consultancies and regionally based consultancies. So a lot to, to chew on. Thank you very much. Um, Sam, uh, can we uh, uh, move on to hearing about comic relief's approach to decolonization? Yes, uh, thank you, Suzanne. And hello, everyone. Uh, such interesting and diverse perspectives we're hearing here. It's it's great. Um, our understanding of decolonized consultancies, freeing consultancy from the cultural and social effects of colonization and eliminating colonial influences or attitudes, meaning power asymmetries, systems and terms based on northern white needs and priorities, favoring consultants who fit the criteria. So we all agree on why change, and we'll focus here on the how. And this means looking at practical action to break down unequal power dynamics and transform policies and systems. Traditionally, those who bring money to the table in consultancy systems and processes have the power to decide how these systems operate, predominantly to the advantage of commissioners, often global north institutions, and to the exclusion of the global majority. Decolonizing consultancy must, must unearth the values and skewed power dynamics that lie behind the consultancy system and then do the hard work of unpicking it and redressing the balance to reflect the priority of those the system seeks to strengthen. As in our grant making, uh, our commissioning must also commit to inclusive design and decision making, transparency, flexibility, power awareness, uh, being trust based and equity and accessibility. Now, on what needs to change and how can this happen? Well, first, we believe that we need some collective visioning, a shared understanding of the end goal, what decolonized consultancy looks like, because what needs to change is very different between making the system we have a bit better versus deconstructing it and building a whole new system, uh, which this series of conversations, Ringo and Waxi, are contributing to. Um, change happens when different players come together and we can change our systems and processes, but there is momentum behind collective action. Comic Relief is a donor and commissioner uh, holding considerable power in this space, and we need to acknowledge this and make real strides to model humility. The following uh, changes speak to small changes uh, to an existing system, but they're so they're not radical changes, but uh, some practical actions might include uh, setting up systems that select consultants who can work better with our funded partners and not just with us in the UK trying harder to reach and contract locally based consultants, meeting people where they are and identifying our approach of hiring consultant. Um, resourcing participation in commissioning and rethinking the value of this time and money spent. Uh, focusing less on the output, if we want something written in English for us, for instance, we should provide resource for this. Consultants should focus on outputs that are useful to funded partners. And last but not least, uh, changing perceptions of risk and compliance, transforming compliance into confidence and being uh, mindful of the language around it because there is power in our language. So overall, our approach is to one, make it personal, take practical action. Um, those systems won't change unless the people sustaining them do. Two, be power aware. Funders will always have power in different forms, but we must ask, is it appropriate for us to be um, to, to be making this decision, or can we hold space for others? And three, enable time to unlearn and change. We're all busy and default to known ways of working, but we need to find um, and somehow create time and space to learn new ways of doing things. Um, a final thought on what needs to change in, uh, is that these systems are made up of people, so there is also a need for individual personal work on anti-racism in order to interrogate our own specific and unique experiences and positions in the sector, looking at who we are, not just our jobs. Now on um, roles different actors need to play, um, Comic Relief is uh, speaking here today, but we're also here to listen uh, from the diversity of experience on this panel and in the audience and learn about what uh, decolonizing consultancy means to others here and how we can take less space. Um, as an organization, we commission much more broadly than research and learning, 
um, like for operational support, fundraising, storytelling, both in the UK and uh, internationally. And in all these areas, Comic Relief is trying to improve our commissioning and consultancy to be more power aware and scrutinize our systems and processes. We won't and haven't always got that right, um, but what we can do as a visible and relatively high profile organization uh, in the UK at least, is uh, advocate for change, demonstrate what we're doing, share successes and failures and learn from others. Ultimately, having set up and operated in this existing system, con consultants globally have learned to play the rules required to succeed using the jargon, writing technical uh, reports in English, etc. We can't just change the rules, even with the best intention, without ensuring that consultants know, understand and trust our intentions, or we might inadvertently exclude. Thank you. Wow, Sam, I feel like, you know, hanging this up, <laughs> you put a lot of very practical, amazing um, uh, courage from a donor and uh, that holds power to change and scrutinize what they're doing. So I think uh, you have a lot to share within the sector of INGOs and uh, decision makers and, and grant makers. So thank you for sharing that. Um, well, what an amazing set of, of contributions and uh, we can see loads of questions coming in. We have time for 20 minutes, so I'll try to capture, do justice to as many as I can and um, uh, invite the panel members to uh, jump in to answer whichever uh, they feel they'd like to. So uh, there's been several people who wanted to hear more from Nancy about the consultant platform that Waxi and Ringo are currently developing. So could you speak a little to that, Nancy? Thank you, Susan. Yes, and, and to everyone, I've shared my email in the chat um, so that you can also reach out to me for more details. But the platform or the community, the idea of the community is that um, we are bringing together everyone um, in the same space. So, um, Mostly, it's difficult for um, a lot of organizations to know where are the southern experts, where are the advisors, where are the consultants uh, located, how do we find them, where where, where are they um, um, largely. So the community brings together everyone. So it's a space that we are creating. It's a community that we are creating for southern experts, southern advisors, consultancy firms, consultancy groups that provide decolonizing consulting to join the community. And it's a space for us consultants to share, to learn, to facilitate um, um, capacity building, strengthening among ourselves. But also, it's also a space since that we are all together to connect with potential um, partners, potential um, um, people or organizations from the South, institutional founders who need our services in terms of advisory support. So that's a space to connect with them. So um, we've started building the platform um, and the platform will soon be ready. So you can reach out to me for more information so that I'll keep you informed in the journey. And we will soon want to engage us potential Southern consultants in the conversation for us to look at how do we build this community of decolonizing consultants together? And how do we nurture this platform? So that is our own space for us to connect, to learn, and also to engage in um, with um, INGOs and funders on decolonizing. So please kindly drop an email to me and we can have more conversation on this. And do note that there'll be breakout uh, sessions. So jump in, put your thoughts, put your questions on the board and we'll get back to you with everything. We have a question from Bev. Forgive me for those with their hands up. We, we're pulling out a few questions and I'll get to you after I go through the, the questions that have come before. Is uh, the NGO, INGO community, community and development discourse too narrow? The corporate world, for example, is heavily involved via their supply chains work and transnational activity on both human rights and SDGs. This is often supported by niche multi-stakeholder initiatives. The power imbalance is deeply rooted in this model and how can this element be mapped into this discussion? So a talk on discourse, should we shift that discourse level within our sector? to be able to tackle all the issues we've been talking about. Who from the panel would like to address this question from Bev? Um, 
I, I can say a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it's actually a conversation I was having with a, with a good friend uh, a few days ago. Um, but, you know, I'm seeing Adesso is seeing much more, or we're, we're talking much more to corporate philanthropy. And so I think that's almost, that's almost like a first step into the corporate world and into um, global supply chains and, and, you know, addressing some of the power that corporations have. I also am seeing um, when, you know, the space that I see where it comes out most is when you're working with uh, organizations or networks who have corporations within them um, as committed to certain change or setting certain targets. Um, and if the decolonization conversation is part of that community network, whatever it might be, um, you're more likely to be able to start that conversation. But it does feel very separate, I would agree, um, which isn't useful. Thank you, Elena. Um, a bit, a, a lot of practical questions are coming up. So, so if Raju uh, is asking in South Asia, most consulting engagements focus more on achievement of objectives uh, and effectiveness rather than creation of knowledge. And we're talking about like the power knowledge embedded in consulting that we're trying to shift. So, so their attention is more to the objectives and affection, uh, effectiveness rather than creation of the knowledge learned through while executing the project. Uh, he's asking panelists' uh, perspective on this. What are your thoughts? I can give it a go. Um, so within Comic Relief, we, we commission both uh, evaluation, but mostly uh, collective learning uh, consultants. So um, within our programs, we, um, alongside the programs, we create, um, we create the opportunity for platforms to be built and facilitated by those um, consultants to work with our funded partners so that they can learn um, and like, uh, learn and exchange, share um, any um, best practice uh, or challenges they might have uh, within their project or the sector um, as a whole. So this is um, a way of uh, doing more learning um, than just uh, trying to assess the objectives. Um, so yeah, this is um, common practice at Comic Relief. Um, and this has been very valuable for both uh, ourselves, but also and especially for the funded partners, because they're the one at the center of this. And this is supposed to be uh, beneficial for them. Um, and that's also why we're trying to um, have consultants that um, are um, the most appropriate for our funded partners. And we've now even evolved towards uh, having um, participative commissioning, um, meaning involving our funded partners in the recruitment of those uh, consultants, because they will be interfacing with them uh, throughout the length of the programs, uh, which are usually between three and five years. Thank you, Sam. Uh, a related, really interesting question is um, uh, someone's inviting the panel to give an example of where donors allowed the locals to create a project and then funded it and didn't impose arduous reporting, but focus more on learning on the local NGOs and communities. So, uh, and this person is also interested in the upfront uh, payment model. It's not a question, but just um, how is that going as well? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us are interested in that as well. So has it happened? Are we saying we're gonna do it or has it actually happened and worked? Creating, um, a project I, and securing. I, 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 can, I can say something here. And actually, uh, uh, donors nowadays are more working into this kind of RFP uh, processes in which they prepare, prepare requests for proposal, requests for application from uptown, up down, and then NGO civil society will respond to. Uh, uh, it's really amazingly that recently this has been done and uh, uh, more and more for this kind of action, but less on my, what we call unsolicited proposals in which where NGOs or local consulting apply for the donor agency for certain, uh, for a project that they need, and then they start getting the money from. 
previously in the 80s, I think, and even early 90s, there was unsolicited unsolicited proposals are much more than re re reactive one. Uh, but now it's really taking so much time because donors are linking their money to their politics. So this is where they get so much time to approve a grant coming from an organization. <clears throat> and uh, uh, and this is uh, this, this is reducing the ability for organizations to fund what they think that they need to be funded. Uh, but yes, it's uh, it's an issue. And this is, I think, donors should be more into unsolicited proposals. And I think, man, some organizations I have been seen. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I when I mentioned the names. But there is this the Alex Institute, uh, this is a Swedish Alex Institute, and some other organization. They started to co-design programs with each other, with their funders. So the facilitators of these programs, I mean the donor agency, work with the donor with the organization, uh, selected organizations because of their capacity, competency, and other 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 information. And again, it's a proactive relationship, building relationship with these organizations like Elena, what they do. And accordingly, they start go designing and go develop their grants. And there's a new approach coming on through a Ford Foundation is trying to, as well as <clears throat> to implement this kind of approach in which they can co-design and co-develop uh, from early stage. And this would reduce the hassle of writing proposals, by the way, from NGOs, which is a difficult job, uh, uh, time consuming. It helps in developing together the outcomes, the theory of change, the theory of change, and the outcomes. And uh, and uh, I think co-designing. USID is now uh, more encouraging in co-designing and collaborating, and co-designing projects uh, and co-creating. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, if you want to go into unsolicited proposals directly to the donor with your ideas. You need to build good relationship with these donors, and this takes time. So you can be a, a good friend for them, and you start putting their ideas. And a lot of corporate philanthropies, as Elena said, and a lot uh, which is growing, growing, growing nowadays. In the Middle East, at least we have we have about hundred philanthropy foundations in the maturity stage to fund and implement projects. Hundreds and more. Emirates at, by itself has maybe thirty. This is a, a, a nice uh, approach to encourage more decolonization, and and I think you have to build for that. As one was asking, build relationships. It's all about relationships. But are they replicating? Are these philanthropies replicating the same power dynamics, but within the region? That's a question. So, so Elena, uh, Rob, when you're working with uh, with communities, do you still impose this arduous reporting and have more emphasis on results uh, rather than learning? Can you share an example? Nancy, I see you also wanna- Yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I think how I, I, yeah, I wanted to share an example from, from the perspective of the Rigo. And, and this is how we have been working with a number of the donors, we've never, actually started with responding to a call for proposal because um, most donors come to us to have a conversation because they see what we're doing, they are interested, and we don't respond to an already designed call for proposal. And I that's why I um, agree with um, 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 Allah's um, conversation about building networks with donors. So they already know you, they already know what you're doing. So they come to you, they are interested in what you're doing and they just, you just support you. And in terms of um, reporting, um, it's, I think one one funder that we are working with um, will just let you know that, just go ahead and then let us know, let we want to be engaged in the process, in your conversation, just let us be part of it, right? So it's not, um, a number of IAGOs, a number of funders are now changing some of the ways that they are also supporting because they are going through the whole journey of decolonizing. So they are few there and it takes time, but then you have to first um, build a network, let them know you, and they will be interested to have a conversation with you to support you without you first responding to any pre-designed terms of reference here. Yeah. Sorry, Suzanne, you are muted. Yes. Thank you. I, I, 
I did what is done. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Nancy. And I see Sam has her hand up. We are about, to, I'm getting uh, warnings that we need to jump into uh, breakout rooms, but please uh, briefly, Sam, respond to this issue because it's, it's quite important and interesting to see how to move forward on this. Thanks. So very briefly, uh, comic relief, we do marginal funding of non-requested proposals. It usually goes through um, calls, um, but we're working on uh, rationalizing proposal submit, uh, submission process and reporting as a whole to make as little burden as possible uh, on the funded partners uh, throughout the program. And we're working on emphasizing even more so on the learning side, not on the results. Um, we also provide uh, core funding um, and organizational strengthening funding to um, a handful of, uh, my, probably more, uh, <laughs> to a lot of our funded partners um, across our programs. And that also uh, supports organization uh, sustainability. Thank you. So uh, we're coming towards the end of, of this um, webinar. And we want to wrap everything up together. and. Uh, before I hand over to, to my colleague and friend, Rick. Rick, are you back in here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, I'll introduce you in a sec, but apparently I've been asked to invite everyone to put, jot three words that at the end of this whole discussion and, and exercise uh, that they associate with decolonizing consultancy. We want to create a, a word cloud at the end of the session. So just three words into Mentimeter. And I believe uh, we have shared the link and uh, code. So Anna, Anna is uh, just shared a link. You click on it and you enter the code and you just put in three words that you associate with decolonizing consultancy. Okay. All right. So, um, as I said, uh, we want to pull the threads together. There's been so much rich discussion, amazing examples of the steps we're taking towards de decolonizing consultancy. And I'm going to hand over to Rick James um, uh, to, to wrap up and pull these threads together. Just quick introduction. Uh, Rick is an organizational change specialist with more than 30 years experience working with over 100 NGOs in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and Europe. And he joined Intrac uh, since 1992 and has been principal consultant, um, a bedrock of Intrac. He has written a number of books, including Consulting for Change and led on the uh, C4C, which is Consultants for Change program, which is something really interesting we, we want to share with you as well. So he's got a PhD in NGO management and is a senior teaching fellow at Bayes Business School, formerly CAS at City University of London. I hand over to you. Gosh, that's rather daunting um, introduction, but thank you, Suzanne, lovely uh, to be here. I suppose some of the things that, that struck me from this really rich discussion and, and fantastic to have such practical inputs as well as uh, such a breadth of people contributing uh, to the chat is almost how you know how really radical it is what we're talking about but also that you know decolonizing consultancy you know sits within a, a wider aid system and there's limits to how far you go without actually uh, transforming that whole system but um, you know there's some really interesting themes for me one of the key questions in any consultancy process is who is the client and I suppose, you know, in this, we we tend sometimes to think, well, it's the commissioner, it's the one who pays who's the client. And then we say, well, actually, maybe we need to go beyond that. It's the national organization or the partner that's the client. But actually, I think Allah's point and, and someone else was saying, well, actually, what if the community was the client, really? They're the ultimate um, here. And so even if we're doing a theory of change, yes, it's good that it's not being done in the north. It's better that it's being done by the local partners, but actually it should be done by the people who are you know, meant to be served and then go up to the partners. So, so really just, we need to go even beyond the, the sort of national partners and recognizing that any intervention is gonna be a negotiated process between these different stakeholders. But you know, if we really want to get community voice in, we need to do that at the beginning somehow, not, uh, not just at the end. So the, the the who is the client was a, a, a sort of 
uh, internal debate for me. You know, who is the who is the consultant? Um, you know, I like the points about um, working uh, uh, equitably, um, but I think also Pamela in the chat said, you know, yes, nationality is important, but actually uh, we sometimes need to go beyond that, that even within nationality, you know, there might be different castes, there might be, uh, you know, genders, there might be marginalized groups, there might be regional uh, differences. So, so again, it, it's sort of going beyond just a simple um, question of, of nationality. Uh, so who who is the consultant, again, is, is more complex and, yeah, and needs to go further. Uh, and even in the chat, there were some things around, you know, focus on West Africa rather than other places. Uh, so, yeah, pushing ourselves even further. And then, you know, questions of how we do it. There were some um, brilliant examples from Elena about, uh, you know, not responding to RFPs, being asked to pay up front. You know, that contracting process is is really critical in, in any process. Um, but also the approach. Uh, and I think what we're, you know, in consultancy, there's a wide spectrum, you know, with facilitation at one end and the expert-led approach at the other. And again, I think if we're, if we're expecting national consultants or we're talking about them as experts, then actually we've lost it uh, right from the start. And it's not about re replicating that top-down uh, expertise that comes from outside and solves an organization or a community's problems for them. It has to be the other way around. So really it's all about, you know, taking a more uh, facilitated approach, even if the client or the community are asking for a more, you know, tell us what to do. Um, but actually you have to work hard to uh, to sometimes fill, fulfill that role. And, and again, the how relates to the methodology design that people were talking about and genuinely using more participatory methods for gathering information, but also for analyzing that information and not just taking it back to, um, to the North. But also the feedback, and again, we, you know, some of the people talked about, you know, the reporting, whether it's in English, who it goes to. What about, you know, if we really talked seriously about accountability to communities in evaluations, what does that actually look like, and is that really built in? Um, it's more costly. Uh, it'll take more time, and who's going to, you know, again, it'll require uh, those committed to it to to put the resourcing behind it. Then there's questions around, you know, what language, um, some really interesting stuff around, you know, the a much more complex language than global north, north, global south. And Allah brought out the the sort of capacity building. Um, you know, my personal favorite is cultivating because actually we can't build. All you can do is sort of create the uh, environment with which something can grow. Or someone mentioned in the chat capacity sharing becoming more common, recognizing that it's often a, a, a two-way process. And people also spoke about, you know, what therefore are the changing roles? And for Northern consultants, maybe it's about shifting from more from a, a sort of doing consultancy to a to a more of a mentoring role in consultancy. And and you know, I think for all of this, then some very real challenges for our own organizations in terms of what we do and and the ways that we work uh, and, you know, again, going, going further than is comfortable. And then what does it mean for me personally? And I think two words that, that struck me um, was, uh, was around humility and not pretending to have the answers, but actually what does that look like? It's very easy to say, but actually it is really quite challenging um, to put into practice. And the other word was courage, and and I think um, Elena talked about being brave and committed and and honest. And what does that look like? But I think that's you know if we can really almost take the personal challenge and really take it personally to work on on genuine humility and genuine courage, I think we'll um, we'll be getting there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. 
so much to chew on indeed so much uh, I, I'm, I'm totally inspired and it's beautiful to be with a community of like-minded uh, practitioners and humans and organizations from all over. Thank you so much once again to the amazing panelists. You have really given us a lot to think about. And uh, I want to reassure everyone who's been asking in the chats and uh, those who were unable to continue with us till the end uh, that we will be producing a summary paper, a blog, a series of blogs and, uh, and uh, the recording. Uh, pulling together the key findings from Retro and Mentimeter and also the discussions that have been had. Uh, I wonder if the questions in the chat we can also save, Andy and Alistair, that would be beautiful because there's been a lot of excellent contributions that and questions that we missed due to shortage of time. But once again, thank you very much, everybody. And um, I think we have our our end painting to share with you a word cloud of what does decolonizing consultancy mean to you? So this is what decolonizing consultancy means to us. Humility, power, accountability, collaboration, respect, trust, lovely. Local knowledge forward, challenging narratives, system changes. I love the deconstructing, uh, deconstructing and then re-cultivating uh, systems, uh, respecting other knowledge, decolonizing minds is essential, the discomfort of doing that, bridging cultures and just beautiful. We'll be sharing this with you as well. So thank you again, everybody. And um, I believe we have uh, reached the end of this webinar. It's a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.